Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen, your host, and we're coming to you on November 8th. It's a Wednesday after the market close. Uh, I've also got Arusha Paris here who joins me every week. He's a portfolio manager over at O'Neill Global Advisors. How are you doing, Arusha? I'm doing well. Is, is, isn't the market much f more fun when it actually goes up, Justin? <laughs> it is. Yeah. And and it, again, I don't know if we have J Joe Fami to thank for that. You know, he was our guest last week, follow through day Fami, uh, kind of ushering in a, a, another wave, another try for this rally. Um, and also to help us talk through what's happened in the last week is John Kosar, who's going to be joining us. Uh, he's Coming back to the show, we've had him on a number of times. Uh, he's from Asbury Research, chief market strategist over there, uh, doing some great work, great research. And uh, he's going to share with us some of the models, why he's changed some of his models, and also all of those levels he pays attention to uh, with that CMT and force of his. Uh, welcome back to the show, John. It's good to be here, guys. <laughs> it's always fun having you. So mm -hmm. let's, let's get right into it. Um, before we kind of get into... Uh, you know, some of your models, let's just tackle the market itself right now, because as Arusha mentioned, uh, it's it's a very different feeling market uh, that we had this past week from a lot of the other weeks, let's say, of this year. Uh, so if we throw up the NASDAQ composite, uh, just real quick, we had our, what we call the follow through day last Wednesday. Um, and that was a signal that we often use for a signal for uptrends where we have a significant gain after we've put a bottom in, we wait four days at least. Uh, we saw heavier volume than the day, day before. Also, the volume was heavier than average, which is something we hadn't seen from the prior follow through days. We had this three waves down that we often like to see. You know, we did have a couple follow through days that failed. And I was noting uh, kind of interesting. It seems like, John, your Asbury 6 model often is right there with us. So you went to a risk on with your Asbury 6. Um, so, you know, what what is what's changed in your mind with this market? I think the main thing that changed is uh, the S&P 500. I'm actually pulling it up here so I can so I can talk to it directly. Forty two hundred was a big level. Yeah. And. The market was holding it, reversing lower, going through it. And during that time, uh, the Asbury 6 was primarily red. It was primarily negative, meaning that the internals at that time, you know, we took that first run. You know, we got down to the 200-day moving average at the beginning of October, and we started a rally. The internals weren't strong enough to make that rally stick, mm -hmm. and we rolled back down. So what changed is um, – Shortly, maybe within a day or two after we bottomed, I think we bottomed at um, we bottomed on October the 27th. The next two days, I started to see the individual constituents in the Asbury 6 start to turn green one by one by one. And um, finally, uh, the indicator itself turned, uh, which meant four or more were green, four or more were positive. Uh, as of the close on the 2nd of November, and all six are green now. So what does that mean? It means under the hood of the market, there was a lot of uncertainty while it was grinding and kind of going back up and through, um, up and down through 4,200. That means the market wasn't quite sure if we were having a breakdown and we were changing trend or if this was a buying opportunity. Once those indicators started to fall in place within the Asbury 6, it gave me the confidence to be able to put out on our research that now is the time to put that money back to work. The uh, ASICs went off on uh, August the 4th. Mm -hmm. So we had been, you know, we had some money on the sidelines, I guess you can say. We were cautious and waiting to see what happened at 4200 yeah. And to be clear, you're not like us. You're not trying to pick the bottom. You're just trying to like, OK, when have things changed? And sometimes that's going to be a few days off the bottom and 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 that's OK. Right. Yeah. There's show business and then there's the financial business. And, <laughs> uh, you know, making a call or, um, you know, where's the S&P 500 going to be on the 31st of December? Um, to me, that's entertainment. Um, I think 
Um, what I try to do early in my career, I've been doing this for 40 years, early in my career, right? You want to get quoted in the newspapers. You want to get on TV. You want to get noticed. Um, doing a lot of forecasting then. I, I try to do as little forecasting as I can and watch the market and watch the metrics that are inside the market and watch it change its um it's basically fear and greed is what we're looking at right yeah, yeah. so i'm doing a lot more i'm not going to make any more money if i forecast the close on the, at the last day of the year than if i just stay on top of the data every day and stay with what i see you don't get any extra bonus points for that so um, I just try to focus on reading the data, following the data, and trying to keep it as clean and objective as I can. So, John, maybe for those who are hearing you for the first time, maybe just go over the Asbury Six. What 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 are the what what are kind of the the six internal metrics that you look at? Sure. Um, the A Six. I'm actually getting over to our website now. We update it every day about two hours after the close. Why every day? Because this is incremental. I wanna see the health of the market. It's like a metaphor that I use for this is when you go in for your annual doctor's checkup. Your doctor sees you come in through the door, your hair's combed, you have nice clothes on, he hasn't seen you in a week or he hasn't seen you in a year and he makes a mental observation of what he thinks your health might be like. He sits you on the bench, he starts checking your, you know, your heart and lungs and your reflexes and your pulse and how you look on the inside may be different than how you look on the outside. That's what this is meant to do. I built this and kept it in house for years. The reason I did is because anyone that's been around the markets a long time know that the market doesn't trade like it did 10 years ago. Um, the intraday volatility is a lot of days. It's, it's kind of ridiculous. You know, we'll be up we had a couple of days last week. We're up 40 in the morning. And we're down 40 at night or vice versa. And that kind of gyration, which is primarily, you know, the computerized trading, that's where the volume is during the day. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really easy to knock you off of a really good idea. So I wanted to make sure that I wasn't kind of getting, um, you know, chasing the tail of the market, so to speak, and had a little bit more grounding in terms of when I was making decisions to move in or move out. That's where this came from. You've, you've got the rate of change in the S&P 500. You've got the relative performance between stocks and high yield bonds. We have investor asset flows, volatility, trading volume, and market breadth. The only one that directly relates to the index, the S&P 500, is the rate of change. I did it on purpose because I didn't want to be, again, chasing the tail of the S&P 500. I wanted to have the market up on the bench and checking its pulse, right? And checking its reflexes and seeing if all the explosions I'm seeing on the screen are really what's going on inside the market. And that just helps me to not get head faked um, and to stay on my game. It's, it's been a huge help with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so now uh, for, for those that are watching the video uh, at investors.com slash podcast or on YouTube, uh, we do have uh, your your Asbury 6 uh, right up there on, on the screen, uh, the, the different metrics you look at. And as you mentioned, you know, they started, okay, first you got the rate of change, then you got your, your asset flows, your volatility, you know, coming in line. And then uh, finally, you got the trading volume and the market breadth, uh, you know, kind of doing the confirmation for you to go to that risk on and, and the dates are there for October 30th on the rate of change, um, October 31st for the asset flows and volatility, and then uh, the final components being that that trading volume and market breadth on November 2nd. So, um, yeah. And, and how often do you kind of, sh or not you because it's the market, but how often does this typically shift uh, throughout the year or throughout the cycle? It's, uh, it doesn't change every day. Um, but it's fast, it's fast twitch. So mm -hmm. what we did is um, we, to try to measure how many round turns there are during the year, if, if you follow this, and this was supposed to be fast twitch, this was supposed to be set to the month. Uh, so if you look at four or more green or positive, that's an on signal or that's um, a plus signal and four or more red is a negative signal or a sell signal, 
there's been a, a little bit over nine round turns a year going back to uh, um, five years ago. You know, we went back five years for this. Um, we back tested it actually incrementally, which makes more sense to me. So each of those six have one sixth of a, a portfolio, say a hundred thousand dollar portfolio. And as they turn green, you're adding them in 16.7% right. and then again, and then again, and peeling them off. That's how we actually did the back test. But in terms of how active is it, if you're looking at it as four or more indicate, uh, the indicator itself has turned bullish um, and, and four red or more as the indicator turned bearish, it's a little over nine spins a year. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, let's go back to the market a little bit and maybe we could have you, um, you know, talk about uh, some of the levels that you were looking at. That 4,200, of course, as you mentioned on the S&P 500, um, really important. I mean, it, it kind of was, you know, right in line with where we were uh, back in February, um, you know, when we topped, uh, kind of hit resistance there. And actually, it was important back in 2022, uh, a level of support, a level of resistance. Um, but what 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 do you see next? I mean, you've got this line drawn uh, against all of the tops, uh, all of the near term tops here on the S and P five hundred. We haven't broken up above that yet. So, does this still have more work to do to to convince you, or is this enough with the the internals kind of changing? No, our CPM model um, is risk on. the The Asbury six is all green, so that tells me the internals of the market are where they need to be for the market to go higher. So now if you're managing money, um, whether it's your money or whether it's your client's money, the next question is, where do I add more risk is how I would look at this. Yeah. So what you see there is the peak from October 17th at 4394. And then you've got the trend line drawn off of the July highs at 4421. So if I'm managing a portfolio of money, doesn't matter whose it is. And I'm in the market and I've got some, I have some money on the sidelines. The next question is, where do I want to put more money at work? Since the Esbury 6 is green, the CPM is risk on, but you still never, ever, ever want to buy right under resistance and you never want to sell right into support because your risk reward is upside down at those places. Yeah. So right now we're roughly, let's say we're 4,400. We're pretty close to 4,400 for me. I want to see it break that resistance before I put another piece on, put another mm -hmm. long piece on. And if we hold 4,400 and we break down a little bit and the Esbury 6 is still green, I may be looking for places to add that are underneath the market. I just want to stay away from doing business on the wrong side of these support and resistance levels. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, John, so if, if it was pulling back, do you have a specific level? Like, is it the 4343 level or 4253 where you would consider adding? Or do you need that to have the, the break of that 4400 level first? Oh, no. As, as long as the internals stay strong, and for me, as long as the Esbury 6 is green, Okay. if we get back to 4343, that's the 50-day moving average. You know, okay. you can see usually after a day or two if there's some if there's some buyers coming in, I don't want to be the first guy in ever. So <laughs> I would rather see some, you know, some buying coming in or some stabilization at 43, 43. If that doesn't hold, we go back to 4253. So that's what I'm looking at is where um, you guys have been doing this a long time. You, you know, everybody knows the market goes up over time. The market's been, you know, going up for a hundred years. The trick is where you put them on and where you put, you know, where you put the positions on and where you take them off. I want to make sure that I am putting new positions on either after we break a resistance level or after we come to a support level and our models here are telling us the market is internally healthy enough to put new money to work. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you use the term offsides uh, when we were having our pre-show huddle and I, I thought it was such a great analogy. And even further, when you're saying you don't want to be the first guy into the market, you know, in the same way, you don't want to be that guy that's jumping the gun on the, <laughs> on the scrimmage line um, and, and, and causing a penalty because of it. Uh, you, you have to make sure that you're kind of on the right side of the market um, and, and where, you know, where, where it's kind of pushing, everything's pushing at the same time, as opposed to this lone, this lone guy all by himself. Yeah. Um, the upsides that I was talking about was, um, 
back in October of last year, mm-hmm. the market was offset off sides. That's you know the reference. Um, it was it was out of balance according to standard deviation. Um, mm-hmm. Investor sentiment was too bearish. Uh, a lot of the market breadth metrics we look at were they were washed out looking. Everything was looking like a market does when it's near a bottom. It's too extreme. It's gotten off sides, right? Off sides. It's moved away from the norms. So the next thing that we do uh, do is we wait for our models to tell us when it's time to buy, right? I just didn't cross my fingers um, and buy on October 1st. I wanted to see the ISBR 6 um, and the CPM turn back to risk on. And when they did, which was about a week or so after the bottom, that's when I felt comfortable getting in. We had that same offsides here while we've been negotiating 4,200. Standard deviation got out of whack again. One of the charts I have for you today is investor sentiment. Investor Mm -hmm. sentiment got too bearish. Some of the market breath. So different price, different time, but that offsides kind of um, phenomenon as I like to call it here, you know, the market was stretched out to the downside. Uh, so you wait for it to react to whatever the support level was. It was 3,600 you know, last year. It's 4,200 this year. And then you wait for our models to tell you that the market is, is internally strong enough to actually act on that. And that was on um, November the 2nd this time. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know what? Let's go ahead and uh, get into this a little bit further in our next segment. Uh, we'll we'll show the charts and show exactly what you're talking about here. And um, again, try and get us on the right side of the market. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. The stock market moves quickly and it can be a lot to keep track of. But what if you had a team of experts feeding your research and trade ideas every morning? Market DM by Investors Business Daily is a daily newsletter that boils down everything you need to know about the stock market into a five-minute read. You get actionable trade ideas for stocks and options in your inbox every day, plus educational lessons to help you elevate your trading. Subscribe today for only 20 bucks a year. Just go to Investors.com slash Market DM. That's Market D-I-E-M to get started. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here, your host, along with Arusha Pierce, who joins me every week. He's a portfolio manager over at O'Neill Global Advisors. And our special guest this week is John Kosar from Asbury 6 Research. I Sorry, Asbury Research. We were talking about the Asbury 6, but it is just Asbury Research. The Asbury 6, of course, is one of the indicators that we've been discussing. Um, and in our last segment, we were kind of talking about the market and how you get on the right side of it, not off sides. And you were mentioning the, the sentiment and you shared with us a chart here. So again, for folks that are maybe uh, listening to this on audio, we'll try and describe it as best as we can. But you can also look at the video at investors.com slash podcast or uh, find it on you, our YouTube channel. Um, but John, walk us through this. Uh, what, what are we seeing here with this futures trader sentiment? Um, and why, why do you use this particular sentiment gauge? What this is, is, uh, and I look at a lot of sentiment. Um, we look at the investor's intelligence data. We're actually one of the inputs for them. This is our little variation on Jake Bernstein's daily sentiment index, or I don't know if, if you um, are aware of Jake. Jake's been around a long time. When I first started on the floor in the 1980s, the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Jake was one of those three or four guys that everybody was following and subscribing to his newsletter. There's a lot of work with seasonality, a lot of work with sentiment. So this is um, uh, just a slight variation um, on his data. So I want to give the credit to him. But what he does here is um, he has a daily survey of futures traders. And futures traders are near to intermediate term followers of the trend. Mm -hmm. So like anyone who follows the trend, you're wrong at the turns, right? Because you're too bullish on the tops and you're too bearish on the bottoms. So I look at this as one of those environmental indicators that tells me if the market's getting off sides again, right? There's that word again, but is the market getting too stretched out either on the long side or the short side? So that bent green arrow on the bottom there on the bottom panel all the way to the right that's showing that 
the survey is bouncing off of a least bullish extreme of only 17% bullish on the S&P 500, which is the chart that's up top. Now, if you're in a bear market, it could stay that way for a long time. You look right next to the bent arrow over to the left just a little bit, you see it stay down there for some time. That's because yeah. we were in a major downtrend last year yeah. and it remained um, there for some time. But in a, a more of a balanced market, especially in a bull market, if you're in a major uptrend and you get a chance to buy when it's at those least bullish extremes and it's off sides again, there's that word again, that tells me that now I need to start looking where support is on whatever I'm trading. And I need to start to look at our tactical tools, the A6 and the CPM to tell me when it's time to pull the trigger. So that's the significance there is when it was moving into that 17% bullish area, the S&P 500 was flirting with 4,200. So I had two of the three pieces that I needed to put a position on. The third one was when the market internals were strong enough that I can actually pull the trigger that day. And as I said, that was a few days ago, according to our own metrics. All right. Now, I, I want to ask you about this area in 2020 and 2021, where this futures trader sentiment really seemed to poke above that 82%, um, you know, or, or that, that red line. Is that at 82%? Is that what the red line is sig signifying, the dashed line? Yeah, that was just basically me eyeballing that and looking yeah. back over, you know, you're looking at five years of data. I'm looking back at probably 10 and trying mm -hmm. to just kind of see where those parameters are. Um, yeah. For most so so do you up. use this on the top side as well? Uh, because it seems like, I mean, it, it really kind of nailed it in this most recent uh, downturn where it got a little bit ahead of itself on the bullishness. Um, but there was a lot of that extreme bullishness from 2020 through 2021. And right. the market was kind of still going up. But if you looked at growth or like ARK K, I mean, that was certainly getting hit. So uh, wh what do you make of that with the sentiment? You know, it's really good. I think that's um, a really good analogy to this is the markets generally go up. So it's more likely for them to be overbought than oversold. It's more likely for them to be at a most bullish extreme than a most bearish extreme because people like to be bullish. Um, overbought and oversold indicators. One of the first of many mistakes that I made early in my career was, uh, you know, in the 1980s, we didn't have computers on the floor. So I was doing stochastics, you know, by hand mm -hmm. after work, um, you know, on my, you know, in my, in my apartment, on my kitchen table. And I thought, wow, every time the stochastic gets up to 82, I just have to sell it. Well, yeah. Guess yeah. what? I sold it in the middle of a big bull market and I got run over. And that, right. was, and that was a hard lesson to learn. So whenever you're looking at these type of indicators, um, the buys, um, you know, the oversolds, let's call them, are usually more meaningful just because I think a lot of that is because the market has an inherent bullish bias. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also think with yeah, and I agree with you definitely, John. With the it always seems like the oversold, the fear part uh, is a little bit more dependable because everyone seems to get fearful at the same time, but everyone kind of enters the market at different times, and then eventually everyone's like, "Oh my God, we're all making money," and then then it gets greedy. But that greed can go on for a little bit longer. Yeah. So if we were in an extended bear market, which you hardly ever see, right? If we were in an extended bear market and we had a move up to uh, the most bullish, you know, the red part that's on top, mm -hmm. yeah, that would be a screaming sale if we were in a bear market. But the problem is um, you don't get a lot of bear markets. Mm -hmm. And during bear markets, you often often don't get that large of a opportunity to sell into. So, you know, this obviously works better as uh, an opportunity to tell you when you should start looking for an opportunity to buy. Mm -hmm. So uh, another thing that I just want to kind of, well, two more things to kind of discuss, um, you know, the, the seasonality aspect. But before that, you know, there's that that old saying, don't fight the Fed. And uh, if we pull up the the TNX weekly, so that's this is the 10 year treasury. Um, is, is this another way to stay on the right side of the market? And I mean, this has been tough because we have this extremely low interest rate environment, Fed funds basically like 
you know, at zero for an extended period of time. And then it was, okay, look, we're going to, we're going to kind of normalize rates, which everyone knew was coming. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, the fear was when are they going to take the punch bowl away? Um, what, what is it about this TNX weekly chart that we can make sense of in terms of how this could potentially help us be on the right side of the market? Sure. Um, I don't, um, pay a lot of attention to the day to day hand wringing about the Fed. What's the Fed going to do? You know, did the Fed mean this? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Fed doesn't know what they're doing. Uh, you know, you hear that all the time. You know, the poor man. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's, he's, One of know, the most thankless jobs yeah, ever, right? Yeah. I would hate to have a job where everyone else in the world was smarter than me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, well, and then you had, what was it? Like the, there were, 10 different fed people uh you know speaking uh you know <laughs> earlier this week uh, and it was just yeah. like yeah i'm not smart enough to figure that out uh, the reason that i have this here is because last year as rates were rising um this is the this tnx is an index of the yield of uh, the yield of the 10 year note you know for those mm -hmm. that are you know wondering what that is so last year the yield of the 10-year note was running up towards uh, 425, 430. This was like right around the beginning of October of last year. And looking across that chart, I saw that that was the old high from June of 2009. If you look, look hard on that chart, it was bumping up against, at that time, a 13 or 14-year high in rates. And my thought was, especially since I was looking for a bottom around 3,600, if rates were to hold there and move back down, that would give the market a little bit of, um, of breathing room. Rates are coming down. You know, people would be more comfortable in buying the market. So that was part of that whole process of making the bottom in October of last year. So I put this up here this year because now we're testing 5%, right? That's what the 50 is according to the TNX. It's a big fat number. And then if you look right up above there, You've got 53.39. So that's basically a 5.33 yield. So my thought was, okay, now we're kind of like in a rerun of where we were last year, but only, you know, the yields are higher. So yeah. if, if it's very unlikely that we're going to break that the first try, because those are the highs going all the way back to June of 07. And then if you go even farther back to the left side of the chart, you'll see that that was a bottom back in December of 1995. It's a big level. That 533 level is an enormous level. So looking at everything, my thought was the same. If we hold in here somewhere between 5% and 530, and we go back the other way, the way we did last year, that's a launching pad for a new rally. Mm -hmm. Just like the one we had last year, but with a different attached uh, yield level to it. And that appears to be what's going on now because we've dropped 50 50 basis points since then. So that was part of the strategy of looking at 4,200 as a spot to buy, because this could be a month, this could be a several month, if not a several quarter peak in long-term interest rates. So that just kind of weaves into everything else that I look at. Yeah. Are you using inflation at all in this? Uh, you know, because of course, you know, the CPI, uh, in fact, that October 2022 low corresponded to, you know, the, the, the CPI getting super high and, you know, ring of hands, but then the market kind of bottomed it, like actually, you know, came came back quite, quite strongly. So is inflation something that you're also watching closely? Or is this your gauge? For me, this is my gauge, the more ingredients that you put into this, the more difficult it is to come up with a clean answer. Mm -hmm. So I'm not looking at this, trying to determine what the Fed's going to do in January or where inflation is going, just that this is a giant level in the yield of the 10-year note that is very unlikely to be broken. So I don't know what it's going to do in three months or six months. I know that if we hold 5% to 533 and yields start to drop reasonably hard after all this, all the um, pressure yields have put on stocks as they've gone higher. Because if you look, after we broke 425 or 430 and yields took off to 5%, that was the move down we had from the 
peak that we made at the end of July, right? So this is just the inverse now. So I'm trying to not to get too um, smart and try not to figure out too many pieces, but rather find these inflection points and in yields and see how I can use them to highlight an opportunity for me in stocks. Yeah. Let's try to keep it simple. So John, we are in November now. And so let's talk a little bit about seasonality because this is one of the strongest months uh, of the year for, especially for growth related stocks. Um, talk a little bit about this chart here and, and what that means. That's sure. a lot of green. <laughs> in my, the way that I look at, um, I'm actually getting there with you here. Give me one second. Here we go. I look at seasonality as either being a headwind or a tailwind rather than a reason to put a trade on. Okay. So if I'm already, if I'm already bullish and I see I've got some negative seasonality that's coming at me over the next couple of months, I may handicap my expectations for how far I think that might go, right? Because I've got the wind in my face. I've got the trend right, but now I've got the wind in my face because of seasonality. In this scenario, we've got the opposite going on. We just tested 4,200. We have yields coming off of 5%. We've got the Asbury 6 is green. The CPM is telling me risk on. Now I'm looking at this. This is the 13 weeks of the fourth quarter in the S&P 500 based on data going back to 1957. That's showing me that the first, second, and third weeks of November, and the, uh, those are the green columns, those are the three strongest weeks of the entire quarter. So I've got a lot of strength up front. I got a little strength in back. So that tells me it actually, you know, for me, this is a tailwind. This tells me if I've got the other stuff right, I should get a little push from behind based on seasonality. That's why it's important. That's why I wanted to show it to you today. Mm -hmm. And it kind of makes sense that, you know, okay, where we're at right now, if we get, you know, I mean, we certainly had a big push the first week. Um, you know, maybe, maybe the second week doesn't come in as strong this time around. Um, but uh, certainly a, a pause seems like something we could have. Um, and anything else to kind of glean from this for the end of the year? Because you're, you're showing the green part as November, um, but what about December? Um, that looks that looks pretty strong too. Yeah, it actually is. Um, let's go back a step. This, when you look at these charts, um, it doesn't often follow week by week. By week. It's okay. really not that you know, precise. So I'd like to say that rather than telling you what's going to happen over the next several weeks, it basically rhymes. You know, the mm -hmm. sequence might be out, but we know that November, if you look at an annual chart, we have annual charts of this, of course, November is the seasonally strongest month of the year. Um, again, same data going back to 1957 in the S&P 500. December is the third strongest. So you don't have quite as much strength there. But <clears throat> you've probably noticed, um, it, it, it just you know, anecdotally, it's certainly been the case the last three, four, five years. We have a strong fourth quarter. Um, you know, we may have a little bit of a lull in December. You know, where managers are done for the year, and uh, you know, the markets generally kind of, you know, they basically roll up the sidewalks in Wall Street after Thanksgiving, right? It just gets a lot more quiet. But this um, general. Um, configuration, um, again, it folds in very nicely with what's happening right now. And that's we held support, rates are coming down. Um, so it's just a good fit. The more diverse metrics that you get telling you the same answer, the better idea you have. Yeah. I, and I think that's the, that's really the key there, John, is you and you had the A6, you had CPM, you had seasonality, the all of these different variables all coming together. And that's slowly getting you incrementally more bullish, right? Sure. It doesn't tell you what's going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. Something happens. Something, you know, we've got a couple of wars going on. We've got an election coming up. And uh, there's, there's always, it's never, there's no such thing as a, a perfect trade. Um, things can change. So just giving up the fact that we don't know what the future is, we try to get as much, 
on our side for what we know right now. But you know what? That's what the Esmer 6 is for. That's what the CPM is for. They're very sensitive, especially the A6. If I start seeing these incrementally start to turn red, I'm looking for places to limit my risk. It doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to get out of the idea, but I may get partially out of the idea and maybe look to put them on lower or put them on after the sun comes out again. But I'm not like, well, everything's cool. I'm going to the beach. I'll see you in January. Um, you know, you need to watch this every day. Yeah. Very good. Well, when we come back, we're going to get into a little bit of some of the stocks or ETFs that are on your radar. Uh, we'll check in with one of the other uh, models that, that John has. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with that. The stock market moves quickly and it can be a lot to keep track of. But what if you had a team of experts feeding your research and trade ideas every morning? Market DM by Investors Business Daily is a daily newsletter that boils down everything you need to know about the stock market into a five-minute read. You get actionable trade ideas for stocks and options in your inbox every day, plus educational lessons to help you elevate your trading. Subscribe today for only 20 bucks a year. Just go to investors.com slash market DM. That's market D-I-E-M to get started. Welcome back to Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here, along with Arusha Pierce, who helps me out every week. He's a portfolio manager over at O'Neill Global Advisors. And our special guest this week is John Kosar from Asbury Research. And uh, he's been sharing with us a lot of his models. And um, the, the the next one we're going to talk about is the CIF model, uh, which is his uh, sector ETF asset flows. Um, but before we get into that, John, uh, you, you've kind of introduced... For some people, you know, that have heard you before, uh, refreshing them on on some of your models. But for people that maybe are a little bit new to your stuff, uh, where's where's a place that they can find find out more information? Probably the easiest place is to go to the Esbury Research YouTube channel. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of videos there. There are videos about the CIF model, about the CPM model, and about A6. There's um, cuts, you know, little clips from other videos that I've done in other places, you know, from our pay site. Uh, there's also a lot of information on asburyresearch.com there. There's uh, a section on models. So in between those two, um, there's plenty of information there. If you have any further questions or want to ask about our services, uh, go to the contact tab. Tell me, um, you know, you saw me on um, IBD and we'll send you some information via email. Yeah. And that YouTube is at Asbury Research. So certainly something that's easy sure. enough to subscribe to. So uh, you can get get a lot of content there. You do a lot of um, uh, pretty frequent content where, you know, you're kind of updating folks on on your thinking and it's it's, it's a lot of great stuff. Um, so let's uh, let's get into some of the sector uh, ETF analysis that you do. And we're going to start with utilities. Really? <laughs> you know, so uh, XLU, uh, the you know of the eleven sector spider ETFs, uh, this is often known as uh, one that's very interest rate sensitive, um, and also one that tends to be more defensive. It's been below the two hundred day moving average line. What's what's got your interest in this one? Well, it's strictly the model. Uh, okay. What the model does, what the CIF model does, is. Sector rotation has sped up a lot over the past five years or so. The trends yeah. don't last as long. And by the time you can see them on the chart, a lot of times they're halfway over. Mm -hmm. So I developed a methodology rather than trying to follow the relative performance on the price chart. I wanted to get ahead of that. So I'm actually tracking the asset flows that are moving around the 11 sector spiders. And we do it in multiple time frames. So mm -hmm. the reason that XLU showed up, as I'm clicking there, you can see um, since October, it's had a pretty good move. It had a pretty pretty aggressive move up. That was driven by a lot of move, by um, a relatively large amount of money within the specter of the 11 sector spiders. There was a flush of money that went in there over the past month. It drove the price up and it made it show up on our model, right? So of the top three in terms of their scores, we have a ranking system, again, that's based on asset flows, the speed of asset flows in, and then the speed of asset flows out. And we could rank them by looking across three different time periods. It is a high ranking um, score right now. If that 
money should move out of there over the next week or so. We're going to see it and it's going to get dropped off of our model and something else will take its place. But right now, the way that I rationalize it is about a month ago, we were below the uh, we were below 4,200. And I think there was a lot of investors that were trying to handicap that and say, if we're, if we're starting a new bear market here, if we're starting a new downtrend, we broke the 200 day moving average. If we're going back to 3,600, there was a lot of chatter in the financial markets about going back to 3,600. There was probably mm -hmm. a lot of managers out there that were trying to make sure that they were hedging just in case you know, the market fell. That could be it. I don't know. I don't try to figure out why the money's going there. I just follow the money. If the money goes there, then I'm there with it. If the money leaves, then I go wherever the next place is. But right now, um, it's still in a major downtrend. It's underneath its 200-day moving average. Um, we're running up into some resistance over here. So we'll just see if this is a sticky trend or not. My gut tells me if we're going into a strong fourth quarter period and you're going to have XLK outperforming, XLC outperforming, which is communication services, you know, things like that, this trend probably won't stick. But I'm not smarter than the market. I'm just watching the money and trying to follow the money. So, John, when you see the XLU coming up and saying, okay, there's a lot of money going into this, is there a is there a tactical approach that you take? Like, look, let's just put more money into XLU, or, or are you still at this point just observing it and waiting for a, a price kind of uh, trigger or something like that to tell you, okay, now I should start putting some money in here? That's a very good question. Um, the way the model works is the model is looking for the top three scores. And we're going to look at those, I guess, in a minute. You know, we'll see those top three. And it invests equally in those. And the model rebalances once a week on the weekend based on the previous week's money movement in and out of those 11 sectors. So a week from now, if the money is out of XLU and it moves into XLY, or let's just say hypothetically it moves into XLY, the model rebalances for the following week. So what it's okay. looking to do is stay with the places where the money keeps going. You know, the money's been going into XLK now, you know, technology for the past two or three weeks. It's outperforming nicely because that's where the money's going. So what we found is that by looking at the top three and equally distributing the money across those three, we basically started out with a hypothetical $100,000 account and over the past 13 quarters, CIF has outperformed the S&P by um, in 10 of those 13, and it's done it with about the same amount of risk as the S&P, according to beta and standard deviation and max drawdown. The reason that it's doing so well is because we don't, we're not trying to forecast where the market's going or what's going to be the leader. All we're doing is following the money, and the money's the smartest man in the room, right? So yeah. If, if the money leaves XLU and it moves into whatever the next sector is going to be, I'm going to take a very small loss there and I'm right on top of that next trend. So we're just constantly following the money, trying to find the best. We're trying to find the places where the money's going in the fastest and the hardest. And we continue to shift until we find a trend last year. Um, CIF went into energy on January the 10th, and it didn't leave until June. Did I know that that was going to be a giant trend? I had no idea, but that's where the money went. And if you weren't in energy last year, you didn't make any money. That was where the performance mm -hmm. was. So again, not trying to forecast what oil prices are doing or what OPEC's going to do, just following the money. And when the money changes, we change with it. It's as simple as that. Yeah. So to that end, let's talk about some of the uh, more sexy, I guess, uh, names that are more in the tech area. Uh, and we can start with XLK, which is the technology ETF, uh, Sector Spider ETF. Um, now, it's worth noting that XLU, I mean, that's that's spread out a little bit more. Um, I mean, I think the, the top 40%, 40% or so is spread out among six or seven stocks, whereas for XLK, it's really Microsoft and Apple. 
You know, that's that's 40 percent right there. So as those two move, XLK is going to move with them. So um, what do you what do you make of XLK's move and how much of that is just due to Microsoft and Apple? And maybe even more Microsoft right now than Apple. (laughs) Sure. I mean, you know, those are the drivers. Right. So um, looking at XLK, two things stick out. One, we came down and tested the 200 day moving average last third of October right there. And then we've broken the trend line off of the July highs. There's one, two, three points on that trend line. And we've been up through that. So that's telling me that the money movement that I've been watching in the SEAF model has actually resulted in a, uh, a nice break of a trend line. And would suggest to me, this is a resumption of the previous uptrend that is uh, identified by the 200 day moving average. If you look at a chart of Apple, Apple, obviously, it looks a whole lot like XLK, right? But it also broke uh, a trend line just like this. Um, And then if we go to Microsoft, a little different looking chart here, but you can see it tested its 200-day moving average, and it's just kind of been a road grader. It just keeps moving higher slowly, slowly. And if you... We don't see it here, but if you look at a relative performance chart of Microsoft versus the S&P 500, it's been a steady outperformer for a couple of months. So yeah, yeah it's right underneath the chart here, John. Yeah, that's our oh, relative yeah. strength line versus the S&P 500, the green line. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, there mm-hmm. it is, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can see, I mean, it just slow and steady, outperformance every other day, every third day, it just uh, a nice clean trend. So, um, but again, that, what identified XLK to us was that there was money moving in there in multiple time frames, and as long as the money stays there, the price of the stock's going to go up, and nine times out of ten, it's going to outperform too. Mm-hmm. So, in, in a sense, it's really about kind of going where the strength is. You know, you're going where the strength is, um, and rather than investing in the entire S and P 500, you're picking the sectors that are outperforming um, and kind of avoiding the ones that are dragging the S and P 500 down except in a little different order rather than going. Oh yeah, that's true. (laughs) You said that at the beginning, right? You're not chasing the relative performance. It's the the assets. The money is what causes the strength. Of course, there's other factors, right? There's interest rates and what's going on in the news and earnings and everything else. But basically the money, first the money moves and then, then whatever you're looking at at the, um, on the chart starts to move. It's, you know, it's very much a cause and effect. And that's the basis of the model is to try to get in front of waiting for the chart to show you what you want and getting on top of that trend a lot earlier. Like I I mentioned last year with energy on January 10th, XLE did not look like a a chart you wanted to buy back Mm -hmm. in January of last year. But as the, but as the money stayed there, it looked a lot more appealing. Um, so I'm looking for January here of last year. Maybe you can find it for me uh, if we're looking at XLE. But it it takes – it's cause and effect. It takes time for the asset flows going in there week after week after week and starting to branch into multiple time periods to actually make the pattern on the chart that you want to buy. So this lets us get on top of these trends a lot earlier. Mm-hmm. Well, what Was it January of 2023 or January of 2022? Uh, it was January of 2022. Yeah, yeah. So go ahead and go to the weekly chart, Arusha, for those uh, following along at home. Um, and then, yeah, you can show the January 2022, which is a, yeah, a, a very different look. This is this is what was working, as you mentioned. Um, and you can see that with the relative performance versus the S&P 500, the green line, um, you know, really outperforming the S&P 500 for the entire year, pretty much, uh, at least until the third quarter uh, or you know, the, the, the first half of the year, uh, then it kind of struggled after that. When we sort of broke out of that, there was a sideways kind of a, um, a sideways pattern there really from June of, uh, 2021. Yeah. So you draw a horizontal line right there and yeah. that got right in front of that breakout. And once mm-hmm. that happened, everyone that's looking at charts is saying, Hey, this is a breakout. This is a six month breakout. So you attract even more money at that point, but that's what we're trying to do because the, sector rotation has sped up so much i was looking for a way to participate in these trends quicker and following the money allowed me to do that 
and and you know just since we're talking about XLE, oil has certainly uh, been a little bit choppier <laughs> this year. It's it's had its moments where it's been um, you know doing really well, but lately it's kind of come down you know quite a bit. It just you know just took out some areas of support, um, and you know as you've noted, the money really did flow out of XLE earlier. Yeah, I'm actually looking at our own chart here. XLE was actually one of the top three in terms of a ranking score in um, in the CIF model um, on July the 31st. It moved okay. in there on July the 31st, it, um, and it moved out of there middle of September. So there wasn't a big move. But we were able to catch a little bit of that move. But as soon as the money started moving out of there and going elsewhere, we did too. And it kept us from being in the market while it's, you know, it's kind of getting, you know, it's been beat up here the last few weeks for sure. Yeah, definitely an, another example of that, that quicker trend that just doesn't last very long. Um, you know, let's go ahead and end this with a, a look at XLC, which is the communications uh, sector ETF. Uh, this one dominated again by two stocks, in this case, Meta and Alphabet. Um, certainly, I think both of those stocks were showing such strong relative strength versus the S&P 500 for a good portion of the year. Uh, this last earnings report really took Alphabet down uh, a couple notches and XLC uh, kind of got dragged down with it a little bit. Meta um, arguably also, you know, initially had a negative move on its earnings report, but it seems to be recovering from that. Um, how does this all factor into XLC overall? XLC's been a really good performer um, for most of the year. We It actually showed up in the CIF model um, on May the 15th, and we held it until uh, early September. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the money moved away from there, so we moved out of the way. It's starting to move back there. So if if you look at that chart, so now it's a, um, so now it's a, um, it's a pick. For CIF, it's in the top three in terms of its ranking score. Again, that's based on the money flowing in there in multiple time frames. But looking at the chart, you can see that's we peaked in um, late July. And then we retested that high again in the middle of September. We retested that high a third time in the middle of October. And now we're taking another run at it. So just from a pure looking at the chart standpoint, if we can break out through that high, there should be some, there should be some, there should be some new buying coming in there. That should get even more money going that way. So that's one that is, uh, we don't have a breakout here yet. It's still above the 200 day moving average. So we still mm -hmm. have a major uptrend. And I'm already starting to see some money flows according to CIF. But my expectation would be once we get through the highs that we made earlier this year, earlier, like, during the summer, that should bring even more money in there, which is more fuel to the fire. So I'm looking at XLC to potentially be one of the leaders going into the end of the year. Like I said, I don't like to do a lot of forecasting, but looking at this chart and watching the money move in there, it looks like there might be some anticipation by investors that we're going to break out into new highs. Yeah. Um, you know what? I just I'm going to throw a throw a little curveball at you, but I know you can handle it, John. Um, you know, we we talked about how some of these you know ETFs, uh, these sector ETFs, are really kind of stacked. Um, the S and P 500 itself is is getting pretty stacked in some of these you know big areas. That's been one of the things a lot of people have talked about. If we throw up RSP, um, which is the equal weighted S and P 500, um, this is kind of painted a little bit of a different picture. Um, do you ever look at these ETFs as like in an equal weighted measure to kind of say, hey, is this is this really being dominated by a few stocks um, or even the market overall? You know, because, again, RSP is still well below its 200 day moving average line. It's, you know, coming up to its 50 day moving average line um, hasn't hasn't broken that. Uh, is this is this something you're looking at as kind of a, a breadth indicator as well? No. Okay. It's um, just you know, very simply, I get paid by what the S&P 500 does, right? Because that's what we're buying. So mm -hmm. 
this may obviously this indicates that you know the breath is weak but as long as as long if there is weakness in the s p 500 that shows up eventually as a result of this um you know only a few stocks that are dragging the big index up I'm going to see it in the Esbury 6. I'm going to see it in CPM. It's going to start showing up. Um, you know, if I, you know, I, if I stopped buying, uh, you know, the S&P 500, you know, back in July because I didn't like the breath, I missed a lot of money. You know, I missed a really good opportunity. Um, so that's, I try to, I try not to get too, predictive and what might happen. And I try to participate in, in what's happening now. And what's happening now is we're holding support. Uh, a lot of the indicators that I pay the most attention to are telling me the market's internally healthy. We've got good seasonality. There's just a lot of good stuff going on in the market here. If it changes, I'll see it within a week or so, just because the Asbury 6 is going to start to turn red, it's going to tell me the market is breaking down internally, and I'm going to have plenty of time to be able to pull in my horns, um, you know, take some equity exposure off. So it's an interesting chart to look at, um, but, you know, uh, it doesn't affect how I try to position myself in the market or what I try to tell my clients. Excellent. Well, hey, John, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, we really, uh, you know, are, are really interested in your models because, again, it's a little bit of, of a different take than what we do, but it seems to come to a lot of similar conclusions. So uh, I really appreciate you coming on. And just as a reminder for folks, uh, they can always go to your YouTube channel at Asbury Research, subscribe to that and get more information. Of course, also checking out your uh, website, asburyresearch.com. Uh, thanks again for coming on, John. Really appreciate it. Thanks. It was fun seeing you guys. Okay, take care. Uh, that's going to wrap it up for us this week. Uh, please join us next week. We're going to have Charles Harris back on the show. Uh, Charles Harris, of course, is an O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager. I should say Senior Global because uh, he, he's he's like above you, right, Arusha? Uh, but yeah, yeah, sure. I, I think yeah. so. I have no idea. <laughs> he's, he's been doing it a long time. He's the uh, man, though. Yeah, I, I, I used to sit next to him, uh, gosh, 20, 23 years ago. Learned Poor a lot Charles. from him and uh, continue to learn a lot from him. So it'll be great having Charles Harris back on the show. So hope you tune in for that. Thanks a lot for watching us this time around. We'll see you next time.